share with you the West African Cora, which is a usually 21 or 22 string harp. Um, it's a 300 year old instrument whose musical traditions go back 800 years to the, uh, the mid 13th century. Um, I had the privilege of studying the Cora over the course of four visits to West Africa. Uh, I've been three times to Gambia and once to Senegal. And both countries are on the Atlantic coast, so the far northwestern corner of the continent, about 10 degrees north of the equator. Um, so most of the songs that I'll share with you are ones that I learned from the four teachers that I studied with while I was there. Uh, between the songs, I'll talk about some of the background and the history of the instrument. So uh, you'll get to learn you. a lot about it uh, throughout the course of the program. And then right before the last song, I'll go ahead and open up the floor for any questions that I have. This first one that I'd like to start with is a, I want to say it's about a 200 or 250 year old tune. It's called uh, Juba Jekere, and it was written for a person who was the, like the leader of his town. And so uh, it's like a praise song for him, singing for his, his efforts and his work. Uh, and it's sung, as many of these songs are, in the Mandinka language. So the, the Mandinka people are the ones primarily playing the Kora. They're one of about six indigenous groups uh, in Gambia where I studied. So hope you enjoy. Thank you. 
teacher, uh, Morba Kuyate, uh, he took me to uh, a place that was kind of run by a friend of his. Uh, it's overlooking the ocean, about 15, 20 minutes from, from where my teacher was based. And uh, coincidentally, it's a song about kind of the ebbs and flows of the, the, the tides and the waves of the ocean. Don't come on. second song ever composed on the Kora uh, back in uh, the early 1700s. So it's written for Kelly Fasani, who was very instrumental in the expansion of the Mandinka People's Empire from further away from the coast towards the Atlantic coast, uh, towards what, what's now known as Gambia. Um, so it was written shortly after he passed away.
Sorni beduna, jam fatinata sorni beduna. Sorni beduna, sorni beduna, jam fatinata sorni beduna. concentration in the air. Um, so you've got that nice and hollowed out and so from there you would need to stretch a wet animal skin over the open half and then nail it to the back side with upholstery tacks. It's very important to put the skin on while it's still wet. So if it's even slightly dry it's probably got a crack and you just have to tear it off and throw another one on. So to get it on you lay the skin flat on the ground and you put the, the rim of your calabash right up on top of it so that your round side's facing straight up, and you start folding the, the flap to the skin up and over the round side. So then from there, you take a knife and you make holes into the skin about where the upholstery tacks are gonna go. Not for the upholstery tacks themselves, but for rope, because you gotta put the rope through all those holes to uh, tighten the animal skin. So you start off by taking the one end of your rope and tying it off to one of those holes, and then you start stringing it through all the others that you just made, while at the same time you've got your foot on the calabash and you're yanking the heck out of that rope to make the skin <laughs> nice and tight. It's nice and tight like a drum. It's never used as a drum, but you still want it tight because uh, during the change of the seasons or a change in weather, that animal skin is going to want to change positions a little bit. And so you see that this piece here, the bridge, uh, called the bato, is only held in place by the tension of the strings. So it would come off of the instrument if it wasn't for the strings holding that in place there. And so when that skin fluctuates, the bato is going to want to move along with it, changing the position of all these strings. So if we get a really rainy day out and there's some moisture concentration in the air, that skin's going to want to naturally soak up some of that moisture, loosening the skin, which means the bato sags into the skin a little bit, loosening all the plucking strings, which lowers the pitch. And then vice versa, if you go from a rainy day to a warm and dry day, uh, the skin tightens, pushes the bridge out, tightening all the strings, raising the pitch. Make sense? Yeah. yeah. 
And so the tighter you've got the skin on to begin with, uh, basically what that means is that over time, the musician's gonna have less tuning work, which is, I think, a great thing. <laughs> uh, so once you've got your skin, so once you've got the, um, the rope through all your holes, uh, so that's when you can go ahead and go in and make your ring of upholstery tacks. Just go hammering one along as you go along in a line and create a circle here. And then you take that knife again, but this time you're going back to cut off all the rope and remaining animal skin so that you can re-expose the calabash. And then from there, you have to cut three holes into the calabash. So two of those are for the neck the long piece of wood here. There's a hole up top and down below. And then the third hole here is the largest one. So that one serves two very important roles. Uh, the first is so that sound can come out, and the second is so that money can go in. <laughs> and so the reason money goes into this hole is because there are many traditional songs that are named after people who had some form of role in the expansion of the Mandinka Empire. Some fought in battles, some were generals in the army, others may have been uh, politically involved. And that's just a few examples of some of the, the traditional repertoire. But nowadays, if you go to a performance, you know, you might have two, three hundred people out in the audience, and so if there's a song that's played nowadays about someone who passed away a long time ago, and uh, there is someone out in the audience who may be a distant relative of this person, it's then this person's responsibility to come up and pay the musicians, mm -hmm. putting some cord into the calabash here. Mm -hmm. I will not be singing a lot about anyone's family, <laughs> uh, but I'll get into exactly why that happens later, because it's such a huge part as to why all this music exists in the first place. So down here, there's an iron ring uh, that kind of holds everything together at the bottom end. So you take a power drill, put a hole through your neck, slide the ring through and secure it in place. There's a few ways you can go about that. Then you put your anchor strings on. They're mostly blue on this Cora. Uh, so you wrap them around the ring, and then each of the plucking strings get tied off first to those anchor strings and then up to each of these individual tuning rings, which are called conso, And they are also animal hides. So they're cut long and thin and then braided around the neck while they're still wet. And you put each string around about four or five times and then tie them off. And then from there to tune, you have to push each of these up or down the neck. Uh, if you wanna raise the pitch, you're gonna push these up and they'll bring them down if you wanna lower the pitch. All the tension rests on the back side, so you're mostly working with your thumbs on the front side to kind of get it to go where you want to. You don't have to move these things that far at all. Only a millimeter of a movement will change the, the pitch of the string from like a, an F up to a G or from an F down to an E. Um, so yeah, and this is the traditional Cora. This one has been built this exact same way for 100 years. Uh, from the original version in the early 1700s, uh, there are a few modifications made around 1920. Um, so, we've got the calabash. The animal skin is from a cow, uh, both the one that goes over the calabash and the console, the tuning rings. Uh, the wood here, I should say, to get these pieces of wood in, there are six cuts that are made on the front side of the animal skin. So four of those holes are for the two handlebars here. And then the two on the side are for the crossbar that slide just behind the handlebars. And I mean, the handlebars are functional for that purpose alone. The crossbar getting in there kind of helps to further <coughs> tighten that animal skin, which is uh, it's very intentional. Uh, and then, so the wood is called Kano, K-E-N-O. And your plucking strings here are uh, monofilament fishing line. So anywhere between 30 pound and 200 pound test grade fishing line. Uh, there's a lot of different brands out there. Um, 
So they're all going to sound different and look different based on that alone. So nowadays, you're starting to see a lot of core builders uh, divert a little bit from the traditional builds. And instead of using the, the console tuning rings, they'll use guitar style tuning pegs. So rather than having a cylinder shape neck like we have here, some core builders will use a rectangular neck so that you can fasten your guitar tuners to the left side and the right side in order to maintain the parallel nature of these strings because you've got a row of 11 on the left and 11 on the right. So that's pretty critical that you uh, maintain that pattern, if you will. Okay, this one I learned in Senegal uh, last year. And to get there, I've got to change tunings. So there's four traditional tunings on the Kora. Uh, they're called uh, Silaba, Salta, uh, Tomara, and Hardino. So I usually play in Silaba and Salta. All of the, of the tunings are considered to be in, if any of you are familiar with like music theory terms, uh, a seven note diatonic scale. So uh, seven notes per scale. So to go from Silaba, where I've been, to Sauta, where I want to go, I go to that fourth of your seven scale degrees. So here's the seven. So I'm going to go to the fourth. And there's two of those on the instrument. And I'm just going to take them up a half step. So most of the traditional tunings in Sauta, where, where I've gone to just now, uh, are ones that are more common further away from the Atlantic Ocean, a little bit to the east. Uh, but this one I did learn in Senegal, and it's called Jati. It's a song speaking of the importance of hospitality and kind of uh, looking after others.
So one thing that I forgot to mention uh, about the, the modification, the main modification that was made to the core around 1920 is that, uh, so before then, rather than using fishing line, uh, it was antelope hide that was used for the plucking strings. And I've never seen one, uh, never heard one. I was told they more or less stopped making them once the fishing line became available. And to get them on, um, there's a few different accounts that I was told, but it sounds like I had to fasten one end to something solid while they uh, kind of put a sharp end through the other side and just twisted it so it got really nice and thin. Um, and I have to stay there for a while before uh, they could put it on. So much more laborious process than putting fishing line on. So. This one's called Kana Fama. I believe this one comes from Mali and uh, speaks of the importance of overcoming fear. to uh, Tacoma, Washington, which is a little, little north of where I grew up. Um, so during that nine year period in North Carolina, uh, I worked a little bit in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. And uh, so for about a year, I was getting up really early in the morning uh, to go to trail maintenance and construction work. And um, so during that time, uh, the song was inspired by that experience. Uh, so Somada in Mandika means morning, uh, like the time of day. Mm -hmm. 
And so when I was in West Africa, I would usually see the core played at three types of events. Uh, one was very casual and laid back, and the other two were, were quite formal. Um, it was rare to see the chora played solo at any of these. It was usually accompanied by other instruments, uh, some traditional and some that you've seen, such as guitars, uh, like even a standard drum set that you see in a jazz band or a rock band, uh, synthesizer style keyboards even, especially at a larger events. Um, and so historically, uh, men were the only ones allowed to play the instruments and women would sing. Uh, within the last 20, 25 years or so, that's been starting to change a bit. Uh, I feel like I've noticed more uh, women and girls, especially younger, uh, taking on the traditional instruments with uh, increasingly less cultural resistance. Um, and so I would say if there was a a female singer present, otherwise known as a jelly muso. So jelly is another word for griot. Um, muso means female. Uh, she was front and center, like leading the band, interacting with the audience, and all of the instruments historically would tune to her voice to bring out the highest quality of her voice. You had to know well ahead of time what her vocal range was, just based on how challenging it challenging it is to tune these things. So for instance, right now, uh, my Cora is, uh, the most dominant pitch on the Cora is the note of G, and I've got four of them on my Cora right now. So if those four notes were down in F, I would want to know, or excuse me, if my, if my, if my vocalist's range was down in F, I would want to know three to five days ahead of time so that I could tune all those strings down and let them acclimate to being looser. Uh, during that th three to five day period, I'd probably be tuning twice or three times a day until I matched my pitch. One of the instruments that accompanies the kora a lot is called the balafone. It's a wooden xylophone that's played with one mallet in each hand. That one's even harder to retune. Uh, you'd actually have to take an electric sander and shave wood off the bottom of the keys. So good to know your vocalist's range ahead of time. Um, and then the ngoni is the third uh, mandika specific instrument. So you've got the kora, the balafone, the wood xylophone. The ngoni is a loop that's about that long, and it's played more like a guitar. So you have, you have to fret the strings uh, and strum them with the other hands. So an informal event at a, a family's compound. So a compound is, is what they're called in that they are extended family living homes. So if you lived in Gambia, you would likely be living with 20 to 30 of your extended family members. So uh, parents, uh, you know, cousins, uncles, aunts, grandparents, they'd all be living together. And if you're walking into someone's compound, um, you know, you find that most of them had very large open air courtyards right in the center. And then all of the nuclear families would kind of have one or two rooms to themselves kind of out on the walls. Um, and so the family would set out maybe 20, 30 chairs. Folks would come over and listen to some music for a couple of hours. It was just very kind of re relaxing and low key. Two more formal events that I would see the Korah at were weddings and naming ceremonies. So both of these took on three parts. Uh, the ceremony itself happened early afternoon. Uh, then you'd have a huge feast, and then the music would, would come in. And so all three combined was a good 10 to 12 hour chunk of your day. So because the, the last song, that night might not happen until midnight or 1 a.m. Um, you didn't have to go for the whole thing, but a lot of people did. And so at a naming ceremony, what you would find is that it was held exactly one week after a child was born. Like there was no deviation from that pattern whatsoever. And it would be held in the home where the mother of the newborn had spent her childhood years. 
So they may be living with their husband's extended family at that point, but it might also be flipped the other way around, especially nowadays. And so here you would have a griot on a bullhorn uh, talking about the newborn, the family just kind of bringing up well wishes and, and things like that. Um, and then you'd be looking out to the audience who were probably seated in rows of chairs, sort of like this, and there'd be some uh, maybe in the background. Uh, and there could be like 200 people crammed into, a, into one of these family compounds. And I would look out and I would usually see maybe two from one row turn around and talk to a couple behind them. And you'd see this going on throughout the whole entire audience as people were discussing name possibilities. <laughs> so, so the naming of the newborn was a very communal event, and whoever wanted to have a, a say in what the name of the child would be, they could. Um, so you'd have you know, people coming up and talking to the griot, uh, giving cash donations, which would then, from the griot, go to the parents of the newborn to help support the newborn child. And then after about an hour and a half, maybe two hours, a consensus was reached amongst the audience, the griot, and the parents, and the name was announced over the bullhorn, and that was final. So, uh, <laughs> uh, and then, so maybe a half hour, hour later, you'd start to see these bowls of food coming out, and you'd sit around one with six or seven other people, and it wasn't just at a special event like this in how food would be served, it was day to day. It was a very communal event. Um, mostly lunch and dinner is what I found were that way. And so in these bowls of food, you'd have at the very bottom cooked white rice covered in palm oil, which is either orange or red, just depending on the palm tree and the time of year. Um, your cooked veggies, uh, some of them were sauteed, a lot were steamed. Uh, you'd have things like, uh, depending on the traditional dish, like there are very distinct traditional dishes, but a lot of them used uh, cabbage, carrots, cassava, uh, leeks, eggplants, potatoes, onions, uh, variety of spices. And then over the top, the very top, was your meats. And so that was usually, in Gambia, it was usually chicken or fish. Uh, uh, sometimes you'd see goat or beef brought out for a special events. Um, eating was done with your right hands. So you could use utensils they're readily available. I found it easiest to use my hand just because like each of those vegetables were still, even though they were cooked, were still in pretty large chunks. So you might have a quarter of a cabbage or <laughs> a quarter of an eggplant or a carrot in your bowl, um, you know, just sitting there. And then with fish, uh, the way that my Gambian host family uh, cooked fish is that they would wrap each individual fish in tin foil, and it was cooked on a uh, on a grate that sat just above a, an open fire. And so when it was done, each of these individual fish would go with individual bowls. So even though the fish was cooked and still intact, it was pretty much looking at you just waiting to be eaten. <laughs> <laughs> um, so once, once you were sitting around with some folks, you would just kind of mix and match whatever looked appetizing. I think the most important and last step was to, you know, once you had a little bit of vegetable, a little bit of meat, and kind of mix it in with that palm oil saturated rice and you can kind of create a little sticky ball out of it. So, um, and then the music, uh, the music. So that would go very late and sometimes you may have a simple ensemble of traditional instruments like the ones I mentioned, uh, kora, goni, balafon. But occasionally you'd have a large eight to 10 person band with electric guitars, electric bass, <laughs> drum set, keyboards, and they'd all be plugged into a huge sound system, uh, which a lot of them had an amplifier or two that were a good five to 10 times the size of the one behind me here. <laughs> because of that, it carried more of a feeling of a rock concert. And people, would, people would be getting up and dancing, which really worked out to the advantage of the band who really had to engage the audience in order to earn their living as musicians. And so the way you would see this process play out to begin with is that the band will come to a song about someone who passed away a long time ago. We're kind of repeating this theme here. And, you know, uh, this person probably had a role in, in the Mendica Empire expansion. And 
So the singer, you know, whether it's the chorus player or the jedi muso, the female griot, or both in some cases, would come up to the microphone and start talking about this person's origins, like where they were born uh, and how their contributions in life may have affected that particular family lineage trajectory and even overall society at that. And this could go on for a good 10 or 15 minutes while the melody is going on in the background continuously. You know, the singer could be intermittently breaking into singing about this person as they're talking about them. So at the end of this segment where they're talking about the person, they're going to come back and metaphorically they're going fishing. And they're trying to figure out <laughs> yeah. if anyone out in the audience is related to this very person the song is for. So at this point, they're basically saying something to the effect of anyone from so-and-so's family. Based on what I've shared with you now over the last 10 minutes or so and how important your family member is, it's now time. I would like for you to please come up and show your respects in the form of cash pain. <laughs> and I mean, without fail, every time I would see two, three, four people stand up, they'd be walking towards the band, reaching into their pockets, purse, shirt, wherever, to see if they had any cash. And then they'd walk right up to the core player and just start putting cash into the sound bowl. And they'd hand it right to the Jelly Musso as she's standing there on the microphone. And she'd just be kind of grabbing it, maybe handing it to someone else up on stage. Or um, some audience members would get really ambitious and walk up to some of the other individual band members who, at that point, were probably working up a good sweat. So you might have the, the lead guitarist, for instance, have currency pasted to their sweaty forehead. Yeah. <laughs> there. Someone else may get a cap removed and place full of cash and it get put back on their head and just kind of see it spilling out by their neck. And it doesn't have to be a musical event like this for cash to be exchanged in this manner. The rule applies pretty much any time a griot shares information with someone about their family's past. It could be in this person's home. It could be in the griot's home. It could be passing out on the street or anywhere. And I feel that the reason that this is so is because my general sense was that the people really value the fact that the griots are the safe keepers of the history. Like the, this role that they have is carved out in society for them to do just that. And I think the fact that they have the ability to ask for someone's last name and be able to tell them about 800 years worth of their family history means a great deal to the people. And so I think they want to see that this role is continued as a means of preserving their history. And so you know, because they're financially supported for being in that role, um, I think there's a, you know, there's a big motivation for people to kind of keep that going, if you will. So I'm hoping y'all can help me out with this next song. <laughs> uh, this one's called Tira Makan. So sometimes I notice audience participation with uh, some of these songs. It wasn't super common, but this song in particular really stuck with me one trip. And so uh, it has a call and response with the singing. Uh, it's called Tira Makan. So Tira Makan Treore, who is four, uh, he was uh, in what's now known as Mali, the country of Mali. Um, and so he was helping gather people together to form the first armies that would then go out and fight towards the empire expansion. And so it's like a, it's a battle line song that we're, we're, we're singing about here. And so the response is where I'd like your help. Uh, it's three words in Mandika. Translated, they mean the enemy was not successful at piercing Tira Makan with a sword. <laughs> uh, it's a loose translation. So for starters, uh, could you please say after me each of the three words one at a time? Uh, the first word is susa. Susa. Rejo. Rejo. Last word is tiramakan. 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 Good. So now say susa, rejo, tiramakan. Susa, rejo, tiramakan. Good. So now I'm going to sing that to you. And I'd like you just to go ahead and sing it right back to me. And we'll kind of pass it back and forth <laughs> to each other for a little bit. Here it is. 
Susare Jyoti Ramakan 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 Good! So that's the response. There's three call lines that I'll sing to lead us into that. So the first one is a muru ibang tira makan. So that's the enemy tried to pierce tira makan with the sword. Mm -hmm. So that's where we respond with susa rejo tira makan. I'll say keleke muru ibang tira makan. So keleke is a person warning that the sword is imminent, like it's it's close. Um, so we respond again susa rejo tira makan. And then I'll say the last one is. Uh, ifa Tiramakan, Iba Tiramakan. So it's the father and mother of Tiramakan wish for his safe return. Uh, and we'll respond again. Susa Rejo Tiramakan. And that last line gets repeated. So all in all, it's a round of four. So let's try it. Ah, Muru Yebang Tiramakan. Susa rejo tiramakan kelke muru yibang tiramakan Susa rejo tiramakan ipa tiramakan ifa tiramakan Susa rejo tiramakan ipa tiramakan ifa tiramakan Susa rejo tiramakan Good! Alright. <coughs> we'll put it together with the core now. Tira Matan.
it seemed like that was the only song that you incorporated some percussion. Yeah. So is that true? So. Yeah, yeah, but there are traditional songs where you see people doing that as well. Oh. And it's more just improvisation. <laughs> okay. Honestly, a lot of this is improvisation. Um, it's really encouraged that every one give it their own feel. And so, yeah, I heard my Gambian teacher was doing a lot of percussive effects with the handlebar. So, yeah. What is an instrument like that cost? Depends on your negotiating skills. <laughs> <laughs> each, uh, each item is coming from a different vendor. So you're likely going to a farmer for the, the animal skin. Uh, there was, in the, the town where, where my Gambian teachers live, there was something selling just calabash, and mostly for core builders at that. Some people will buy them to actually carry things in, like if they go to the market and you pick something up, they might throw things in the calabash and just take it home. Um, you know, the fishing line, you're going to someone who, tell, who sells fishing and tackle gear, um, and each of these items are going to vary in price based on the quality, uh, which really depends on the time of year and just availability of things. That said, uh, I mean, if you wanted to have one made over there and shipped over here, I mean, you're probably looking at six to seven hundred dollars. If you actually go there yourself and buy one and take it home, I mean, you're probably looking at two to three hundred dollars. So, <laughs> I did not make this one, but my teacher Morba did, and he showed me how to build them. So when I went to Gambia, I would usually come home with two cores. So he would build one for me before my arrival, and that was the one that I took lessons on. And then at some point during the visit, I would make one as he was standing behind my shoulder kind of giving me instructions of how to go along. And so I'd, I'd build one with two per trip. So, yeah. yeah. Could you please tell me how long it takes to make an instrument? So I feel like... Gosh, when we were doing that, I felt like when I was building the Cora, I felt like I put in three seven or eight hour sessions three days in a row and everything was together. But at that point, you've got to like put it out in the sun and let it cure, kind of let it situate. I mean, it was after those three days of, of spending all that time building one, it was probably another week <coughs> and a half or so before the Cora was even ready to play. Okay, so when you first strung it, how long did that take start to finish, and then how long to tune it? I feel yeah. like the, well, the stringing process, gosh, with the console, with putting the console on, that was probably 12 hours, I think, strings and console, because the console had to dry for a little bit. Uh, but then as far as tuning, gosh, I mean, after that week of curing, um, gosh, I mean, that's probably tuning that thing four or five times a day to, to get the pitch up. And then after that, it seemed like it was a bit easier. So, yeah. so now when you routinely do it, it's fairly quick? Yeah, yeah, as long as I stick in the same key. Um, I mean, like, like now, because the, the air is a bit drier out, like I've been having to bring the pitch down a little bit each show, but I, yeah, I don't have to do a whole, it's, it's not, it's not a huge process like this when it's first built, so. Do you have strong thumbs? Um, Point your fingers? I, I suppose, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, uh, Watching you know. Watching those fingers. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, there's some dexterity involved, for sure. Yeah. So, do most core players build their own? So, usually the way it works is that every griot family has someone in the family who builds all the instruments for all the people who want to play in their family. And some of the, the really talented ones, or the well-known ones, get sought out by other families as well. Um, so, so not everyone in the family makes one, um, but there's usually one who's, whose role it is to do just that. So is it tuned um, so that you play a scale with alternating strings? Kind of. Hands? So yeah, kind of. Um, so we're going to go uh, up the, the scale. So what you'll find is that the lowest four notes in the chora are on the left side of the bridge. All right. So then 
then once you get to there, to keep going higher, is when you start jumping across the bridge as you go higher in pitch. So you're going right, left, right, left, right, left. So it's not the most intuitive uh, thing to figure out. Like, like to be able to take two of the same pitch and to go up and down the scale. Comfortably took me a good four to five years, but once I got used to that, I feel like you know, like a new door was opened, and like just kind of used to the, the structure at that point. But I think everyone's different too. So. so I'm gonna go ahead and wrap up here. If you want to have a closer look at the Cora, um, you're more than welcome to. I'll we'll take a picture of one or just. Uh, it's a really interesting build. It might be kind of hard to see in the far back there. So. Can I ask one more question? Sure. Yeah. How many of you are there in America? Like, is there a chorus society? <laughs> <laughs> uh, not yet. Not yet. I mean, I would say I only know, I mean, this would be people who play regularly and some who perform. In the, in the whole United States, probably 20 or 25. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it's pretty pretty small yeah. niche. Society. Right? Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, hopefully it, it uh, continues to build. So. Do you mind if I take a picture of you playing it? Sure. Yeah. All right. So this is another one that I wrote. This one's called Smoky Mountain Sunset.
tonight. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. Yeah. Hope to see you again. <laughs> Have you ever played any uh, like normal uh, American music? <laughs> 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 what does it sound like? Happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> is it is it is it anyone's birthday by chance? No, no. <laughs> Let's see. Play, play it um, <laughs> gosh, it's been like years since I've actually played. Let me see if I can remember it. Dude. Yeah. 